Dominican Republic. Mallorca. The world loves to fly, but flying has a staggering environmental cost. Tourism overall contributes to some 15 to 20 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is having an impact upon the climate system, causing the place to warm up. And the places we love to go to are suffering the effects. This is what I call the chronic damage that's happening to Venice. Are cheap flights really cheap? Even a small family car will not be as fuel efficient as this aeroplane. Should I really give up flying? Watch and decide. Last year, there were 1.4 million cheap flights across the world. It's become a national pastime to bore people with your short-haul photos, from weekend breaks in Paris to stag nights in Prague. You can fly to Dublin for the day, to Manhattan for Macy's, or to Vancouver to watch the whales. Hi, thanks very much. Have a nice. Last year, there were nearly two and a half million flights around the world. Flying may be fast and fun, but every mile flown has a cost. I'll be investigating whether the planes of the future will be greener. The aviation industry can do more and will do more and should do more. Bless this plane. I'll be in India to discover whether their sonic boom could be putting these African lives at risk. And in Venice, we reveal the environmental cost of tourism on this unique city. The contribution of airlines to global warming is one of the greatest threats to our future. With around 107 low-cost airlines operating globally, flying has never been cheaper. We can afford to have holidays whenever and almost wherever we want them. They also offer us the chance to head for the sun and escape our day-to-day -day lives. And many of us want to do this on a more permanent basis. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just visiting, enjoy your stay. And if you're lucky enough to live in Malaga, we'd like to welcome you home. Malaga, Spain. With over 400 flights a day in summer, there's a plane landing here every 10 minutes. A boom in holiday home sales, plus swelling tourist numbers, means that that number of flights will double in the next 10 years. And each flight emits a toxic cocktail of gases. One flight from the UK puts 27 tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere, which climate scientists say stays there for over 100 years. Flying and aviation is a major contributor to climate change. It's emitting greenhouse gases at an increasing rate. Where the emissions are put up in the atmosphere is high up, they have a disproportionate effect as well. So aviation is causing part of the problem of climate change and it's increasingly becoming more important in the future. Tourism overall contributes to some 15 to 20 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is having an impact upon the climate system and causing the, causing the place to warm up. Recent years have seen big changes in the Spanish climate, with prolonged drought, forest fires and high summer temperatures becoming common. In 2003, the temperatures across Europe reached 45 degrees and accounted for thousands of deaths. The summer of 2003 was a very profound event and a big marker in terms of what summers will be like in the future across the whole of Europe. So it's not a case of just looking very far into the future, it's looking, you know, in a few years' time. If we have another summer of 2000, like 2003, we can see how quickly the changes are happening to the climate. Climate scientists warn that temperatures throughout the region could rise by more than five degrees. So actually all these plans people make, you know, buying a second home out here to escape the miserable British weather and the rain, it, it could all go against them because it could just be too hot for them to come out here. Yeah, it's likely to be that. That's very likely to be the case. You know, the climate here can really de decrease in terms of the comfort for, for tourism. It's going to get too hot, too uncomfortable. At the same time, the climate in Northern Europe and the UK is going to be ideal for tourism. We've seen that already from summers such as 2003. Scientists also warned that the sea levels in the Mediterranean could rise by up to a metre. This would jeopardise the future for many of our favourite places. Venice is one of the cities most at risk. There are over 40 airline operators flying into Venice's two airports, nine of which are budget flights. And the lure of those low-cost flights, not to mention an authentic cappuccino, 
means that 16 million visitors will pass through St Mark's Square this year. And many of those tourists just come for short breaks, spending only a couple of nights in the city. The Venice of Titian and Tintoretto is swamped. And the city celebrated by so many is now under serious threat. Venetian architect and broadcaster Francesco de Mosta is concerned for the city's future. We are on the borderline and uh, we think in, in, in a certain way, we think that uh, Venice is eternal, cannot disappear. And I think no one of us is the, that who still live here is thinking something like that. Maybe it's just the one day you have to think, okay, I have to take my luggage, go in a boat and go away. Venice is built on low-lying islands, surrounded by a lagoon which is connected to the Adriatic. The tidal sea sweeps into the lagoon and up the canals. In 1966, a record flood submerged the city in over six feet of seawater. They saw all the entrance flooded to three or four steps. My father went to work and they came with a boat to fetch him from the roadside with the, with the boat that entered in the house. It was something out of the world, incredible. The 1966 flood was a freak event, but digging deep channels in the lagoon for tankers and cruise ships, along with stronger winds and rising sea level due to climate change, has made flooding in Venice much more common. These floods are less extreme, but still damaging. High tide floods are now a common sight from October through to April, and the city can often flood twice in one day. Francesco's wife Jane is an environmental scientist working to safeguard Venice's unique ecosystem. She's concerned that frequent flooding and higher water levels are damaging its Renaissance buildings and she showed us what's happening to her city. The same water that has made Venice possible is the water that's now threatening its future. You know, of course there wouldn't be this marvelous architecture, this extraordinary civilization. On the other hand, you know, there's places where the water is now going where it shouldn't be, like inside the buildings. Grazie. Oh, Joan, this is beautiful. What an incredible building. This is the Cadoro. It's now a museum, and it has the most precious collection of um, paintings and decorative arts. Um, this is what I call the chronic damage that's happening to Venice. It's not a very high tide, but the water is still coming right in, you know, through the doorway, yeah. completely covering the entrance to the palace. And in the old days, you know, you'd have seen not only this veranda, but all the steps going down into the water. Millions of pounds have been spent renovating the 14th century palazzos, but it's a losing battle. The water is two meters higher than it was 600 years ago. And many buildings are irreparably damaged. Byron and Shelley, who fell in love with the old city, wouldn't recognize some of the streets now. Many of the elegant porticos and stone walkways are long gone. Jane, new pavement here that we're walking on. Yes, they've built ground level up as, as high as they possibly can all around Venice to reduce the impacts of flooding. And um, in fact, watch your head here. They've really taken things to their limit. You know, Goodness, we're not the tallest people around, but still we're, you know, quite close to touching our heads on the, yeah. on the ceiling. Just yeah. to put this into some kind of perspective, I don't know, well, I'm about five foot four, so I don't know what you are, and anyone much taller than us hasn't got much of a chance in here. <laughs> Whilst Venice is doing what it can to stem the damage from flooding and high water, the tourism that guarantees its economic survival is also its greatest problem. The type of tourism that defines 
Venice today is mass tourism, which means people coming, you know, in thousands at a time on cruise ships or um, using, you know, low-cost flights. And the contribution of airlines to global warming is one of the greatest threats to our future. But is it fair to blame the problems that Venice faces when it floods on tourists? The city itself is sinking, so wouldn't it face these issues anyway? I believe there is a, a relationship between the numbers of tourism uh, and the numbers of flooding, even indirectly, because uh, the numbers of tourists increase the numbers uh, of flights and numbers of boats. This brings lots of CO2 emissions, a rising of temperatures, and uh, as a consequence, the, the increase of the mean of sea level. And so in this sense, uh, it will bring even an increase of the numbers of floodings. Venice is such a remarkable place. It really is so beautiful. But the hard truth seems to be that in our enthusiasm to travel here, to explore it, we're actually helping to destroy the very city that we've come to marvel at. While Europe counts the cost of cheap flights, emerging economies like India are joining the jet set, which could create bigger environmental problems. The state monopoly of airlines has ended, and aviation moguls are moving into the market, flooding it with cheap tickets. And millions of Indians are responding by taking to the skies. <laughs> India is home to over one billion people and is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Here, just getting to work is a real scramble. Thirteen million passengers a day take the train. That's roughly five times more than use the UK rail network in an entire year. But that's changing because airlines have become a real alternative. The trains are hot, slow and they're uncomfortable. If you're travelling between Mumbai and Delhi, you could do it in 20 hours aboard that. Or you could save yourself money, buy an airline ticket and do it in two hours of air-conditioned comfort. In India, the sky's the future. Since deregulation in the 1990s, the domestic aviation market has grown from just a few million to over 35 million passengers a year. And that's largely due to Air Dakan, India's first budget airline. And the man at the helm is helicopter pilot and entrepreneur, Captain Gopinath. This India did not exist five years ago, and I actually saw it, typically, from a helicopter. As soon as we approach a village, and uh, flew past it, I would get these mirrors-like objects reflecting from, from the sun and disappearing. I found that these mirror-like objects were uh, dish antennas sticking out of mud huts. And right then, it was not a country of a billion hungry people to be fed and subsidized. That's how India was always portrayed, both externally and even to ourselves. It was a country of a billion hungry consumers. So since you started, how much has Air Deccan grown? We started with 1 million passengers the first year, then 3 million the next year, 7.5 million this year. And say in five years? In five years' time, Air Deccan will be fly, flying about 30 to 35 million passengers. So we're taking delivery of one aircraft a month, every month for the next 90 months. And then uh, we'll see after that. India is fast playing catch up with the West. £6 billion is currently being spent on building airports. The domestic terminals are heaving and demand for flights is expected to grow 25% this year. By 2010, it's predicted the Indian middle class will consist of 400 million people. That's 100 million people more than the population of the United States of America. And it's exactly these people who are being targeted by the cheap airline industry. Basically, the potential for this market is, well, absolutely massive. And since the launch of Air Deccan, numerous other airlines are now filling up the runways. 
one of which is Kingfisher Airlines. Capitalising on the success of his beer brand, Dr Vijay Malaya has been hailed as the Richard Branson of Indian aviation. Hello. And he promises the best service in the skies. India and India's large middle class, which is the consuming class, uh, very definitely has a Western-oriented uh, lifestyle and aspirational value. And so when we designed the Kingfisher Airlines experience, we took all that background into consideration. We've redefined service levels here in India. In-flight entertainment, gourmet food, the prettiest aerostasis in the sky. I built it as a lifestyle brand. So that's why it's so popular. Indians may be adopting Western lifestyles like flying more, but some traditions are here to stay. I am a devotee of Lord Balaji, of Tirupati. All my planes have to be blessed before they fly, commercially. It gives us a great deal of satisfaction, peace, tranquility, and, and a lot of reassurance as well. This is the 19th edition to Kingfish's fleet, and Dr. Malaya has another 50 planes on order. It's all part of a recent £6 billion investment in new aircraft by India's airlines. But if you can't afford Kingfisher luxury, you can fly at a fraction of the cost with Air Deccan. Now, today I'm flying from Bangalore to Hubli, which is about an hour's flying time, same as, say, I don't know, London to Newcastle. Now, the person, two people in front of me, has just told me he bought his ticket for six rupees. That's just over 5p. OK, with airport taxes, it's going to end up at about a tenner. You can still see, with prices like that, why millions of people in India are taking to the skies. Thank you. Here's your board Have a nice place, sir. Lovely. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Such is the seduction of low prices and quicker journey times. Over half of all Air Deccan passengers are first-time flyers. People in uh, self-employed uh, professions as well as smaller businesses, earlier they were not dreaming about uh, flying. I think they are now. If it goes on becoming cheaper, people would prefer going by plane. But when it comes to the cost to the environment, passengers are less aware. Which do you think is more friendly to the environment, the plane or a train? Planes, I don't think they pollute uh, as much as the vehicles. I would say the, the air travel would be environment friendly more than uh, anything else. When we come back... Every moment of my waking life is, 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 uh, is having conversations about uh, clean energy and what we can do about it. This is CBC. Unlike most of us, Indians see flying as the greener way to travel. The link between aviation and global warming is not yet being made, even though the consequences are being seen across India. In reality, if you look at extreme weather events, there's certainly uh, the monsoon, for example, has been much more erratic. Bombay has witnessed flooding repeatedly over the last two or three years, unprecedented flooding. And that's a very dramatic, visible manifestation of, uh, of the problem. See, the connection to climate change, to human-induced climate change, is only just beginning to be made in the popular perception. It's better than before in terms of uh, seeing it as more than just acts of God. How much interest is there in India for green policies that puts the environment first? Unfortunately, not much. Uh, the, the dominant thinking seems to be that growth at any cost, and growth means uh, you know, doing what the West did all those many years ago, and doing it much faster and much more uh, dramatically than they ever managed. Um, so right now, right now it's, it's basically uh, you know, mindless, bring it on type of an attitude. The number of people flying internally in India is expected to top 50 million a year by 2010. That's almost twice the number of passengers on domestic flights in the UK last year.
in Europe, you have uh, something like 600 million seats being sold a year. India has got a minuscule of that consumption. So obviously, if, if every Indian starts flying, there will be a problem. But I think right now, in relation to the number of people who are living in India, to the number of people who are traveling, it is a minuscule part. That may be the case today, but it's estimated that carbon emissions from Indian aviation could outweigh that of the UK in just 10 years' time. Tweaks, targets and improvements in emissions from Western aviation are not to be sneered at. But you have to remember, for every bit of progress, it could easily be wiped out by one busy afternoon in an emerging aviation market like India. And then after that, there's South America, and then there's Africa, and then there's China. Here are some random questions. Why has Japan Airlines reduced the size of its spoons to this? And why on Air Mexicana can you not get a drink with ice in? It's all about reducing weight. If you put less weight on a plane, it uses less fuel. And using less fuel is the main way the aviation industry is responding to climate change. But small spoons, drinks with no ice in it, are the environmentalists really going to be happy? Maybe this could be the answer. The mighty Airbus A380, currently in production in Toulouse. When it goes into service, the A380 will be the largest passenger plane ever to take to the skies. The scale of this aircraft is incredible. It's just huge. It's 73 metres in length. It's got a wingspan of 80 metres. It's the height of a three-storey building and is powered by four Rolls-Royce Trent engines. Airbus really went back to the drawing board with this aircraft and started from scratch. And that means it surpasses even Concorde as a major technological achievement. It's not just a big aeroplane. We've designed it to be a very efficient and effective piece of equipment. And we're really aiming to give efficiency in terms of fuel burn, a huge reduction in terms of noise, and to give the passenger a more enjoyable uh, travelling experience. The A380 has been designed in close collaboration with airlines and major airports around the world, and it can carry 35% more passengers than the largest existing commercial aircraft. Engines are a big contributor. They're, they're contributing about half of the efficiency picture as we develop new aircraft. Just to give you a kind of rough figure, this aeroplane is going to be burning about 2.9 litres of fuel per passenger for every 100 kilometres that it travels. So if you compare that to most cars, even a small family car will not be as fuel efficient as this aeroplane. Yes, he did just say that. But let's work it out. This plane could potentially carry 900 passengers, so that's 2.9 litres of fuel for every one of them. And unlike a small family car, this plane will travel huge distances. Nevertheless, Airbus reckons that the A380 is the greenest solution to airport congestion and the growing demand for air travel. And Singapore Airlines, the A380's launch customer, certainly agree with them. We fly three flights a day between Singapore and London. There's enough demand right now for us to fly four flights a day between Singapore and London using a 747. The alternative is we still fly three flights a day with an aircraft that's 20% more fuel efficient than the one we're using now and carry as many passengers as we could on four flights. I think that's better for the environment, it's better for the opportunities that we're providing to travellers and we have to invest in this new technology. But is bigger necessarily better for the environment? Seattle, USA, the home of Airbus's major rival, Boeing. It's here that engineers have designed a plane that's so technologically advanced, it hasn't even been built yet. The 787 Dreamliner won't be as big as the A380, but according to Boeing, size isn't everything. This is a section of the 787's fuselage. And what makes it so unique is the material that it's made from. The Dreamliner will be built from a lightweight carbon fibre, which will give it huge aerodynamic efficiency. It will also use 20% less fuel than any of today's airliners of the same size. 
Boeing's been using graphite composites for over 30 years on commercial jets. And it's a very uh, good material. It's very strong, very lightweight, very durable. And the next logical step was to build the whole airplane out of it. So 50% of the 787 is going to be composite material. First choice, the UK holiday company, was the first European customer to sign up for the Dreamliner. Forget the fancy interior, they say its fuel efficiency was the real clincher. Clearly with an aircraft that is 20% uh, more fuel efficient and is 50% quieter around at UK airports, it made a very powerful argument for us. And the other important thing is it goes a long way without having to touch down to refuel, so you save all the CO2 emissions of landing, taking off for refuelling. But just how green are these planes? While there are certainly concerns that the industry's push to make aircraft more aerodynamic has little to do with the environment and more to do with lowering fuel bills and making air travel cheaper. Better, more efficient planes do make it more efficient per passenger. But the other thing they do is lower the cost per seat for the industry. The forecasts are that air travel is going to get 1% cheaper each year for the next 20 years because of those kind of developments. So you work on them on one hand, but in terms of driving demand, uh, they're bad news environmentally. After the break. So should we give up flying? Yes, we should give up flying. The industry argues that making planes more fuel efficient is key to tackling climate change. But once you've squeezed the last drop of fuel efficiency out of the engine, where do you go from there? Well, you can always change the shape. The blended wing body is a radically different approach to aircraft design and promises big fuel savings. This mount designed the prototype that's currently being trialled as a military plane by Boeing. Basically, it gives you about 30% improvement uh, without any uh, fancy technology added. And from then on, you can use all kinds of physics that we know about to, to further enhance it. But whatever its efficiency, it's a big deal to design a new plane for the sky. And can you imagine flying in a wing without windows? This is not something that will be done lightly. It will be a huge gamble for the aircraft companies, huge risk all round but it's, it's, it's waiting in the wings. Any new aircraft design is unlikely to come into the fleet before, say, 2030. And it may well be the future of air travel, but we need to do something now about the growth rate and about the growth rate in emissions. Um, and the blended wing body is not going to be something that's going to help us tackle climate change in that sense. But if you think a flying wing is real tomorrow's world stuff, and how about solar technology, currently being trialled in the desert in New Mexico? This plane is propelled by the sun's energy and can stay in the sky for months. Well, I draw the analogy, although that may be a bit far-fetched, with the Wright brothers in Kitty Hawk in, uh, in 1903. Where an aircraft flew for a couple of hundred yards at an altitude of two metres. And I think at that time, Nobody could foresee what kind of future air transport would, uh, would create uh, for itself and for mankind. This may have enormous potential in the field of military surveillance, but it can only carry the weight of a mobile phone. So can this technology really be a player in the future of passenger flight? An aircraft is not unlike a household. There are significant energy offtakes in the cabin, for instance, for the in-flight entertainment, for the galleys, the kitchen, if you like. The use of solar power could take some of that burden off the engines, and in doing so, would make the aircraft more fuel efficient. But it's research into clean green alternatives to the kerosene fuel that planes run on that's the real holy grail. Finding a super fuel that will let us jet around the world guilt-free has become the priority of the major oil and engine manufacturers. Oh, and a certain billionaire businessman. Richard Branson's 100-strong fleet of aircraft use around 700 million gallons of fuel every year. So you can understand why his contribution to global warming might keep him awake at night. I realise that the world is potentially spiralling into disaster. I mean, we're self-inflicting a most ghastly uh, wound on the world. And um, so I've realised we've got to do something about it. So, last September saw the launch of, yes, you've guessed it, 
Virgin Fuels, a megabucks investment fund for eco-friendly fuels. He's pledged to invest over £200 million, that's his own business profits, in renewable energy initiatives over the next three years. And this is where the first batch of Richard Branson's cash is being spent. Silly in Ethanol, California, America's green estate. It's currently on an environmental crusade led by the state governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's back and he's calling for California to produce a minimum of 20% of its own biofuels by 2010. I think it's something that the people of California deserve because, you know, we got to have, we got to clean our environment. I'm committed to that. And Branson has invested $60 million in this ethanol plant, which produces fuel from the starch found in corn. What we're trying to do is develop an, uh, new fuels that can be 100% environmentally friendly uh, the, for, for spaceships, for trains, for cars, and ultimately for planes as well. Biofuels for aircraft are a technical non-starter. The difficulty is uh, that they freeze at, high, at low temperatures. Where do aircraft fly? 30,000 feet. It's minus, you know, 30 degrees. It ain't going to happen. Branson knows that running his fleet on biofuel is a tall order because of these concerns. But he's looking seriously at a fuel called butanol, which is also produced by fermenting corn and agricultural waste. What we need is something like biobutanol, which doesn't freeze at 15,000 feet, or a derivative of biobutanol to be considered for jet engines. We've just got to move as quickly as we can, and we, you know, we, we're, you know, almost every moment of my waking life is 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 is, is having conversations about uh, clean energy and what we can do about it. So, the next generation of planes will be lighter, more aerodynamic, and they'll use innovative materials. Big investments in alternative fuels, along with the redesign of aircraft, are things that are happening right now. But are they enough to make a real difference to global warming? Well, the aviation industry thinks so, and says it's being unfairly targeted in the debate about climate change. I passionately believe that this is an industry that understands the environmental challenge and is taking it very seriously. And it has an astonishing track record in terms of improving the performance of aircraft, including the environmental performance, over the past two or three decades. We have to keep this thing in perspective. I mean, people are going to travel, uh, but I think we also have to keep it in perspective that the challenge is on us as airlines to become more environmentally sustainable in the way we operate. So, should you really give up flying? Should you really jet off on that weekend break? Should you really buy that remote holiday home? And coming up, why flying has been declared a sin by the Church of England. In an ever-changing world, and you watch CBC News Morning with Heather Hiscox. Explosion and the rest of the team. The Breaking news. We've got the information to get you going. CBC News Morning with Heather Hiscox. Weekday mornings on CBC News World. I want to be on the, the captain of the Canada hockey team. I want to be in the Royal Canadian Army. I want to be the Prime Minister of Canada. Homegrown Muslims, Wednesday at 10 Eastern and Pacific on CBC News World. Now, if you're a sinner in the emission stakes, then there is a way that you can repent. It's called carbon offsetting. Government's doing it, big business is doing it, and we can all do it too. You see, every time that you turn on a light bulb, get in your car or hop on a plane, you add to your personal carbon footprint. Now, this is the legacy of carbon emissions that you leave behind you for future generations to contend with. But trying to offset those emissions by investing in an eco-friendly project is becoming increasingly popular. like this one in Karnataka in India. Lives in poor rural villages are being transformed by a project to install solar-powered lighting. We are in front of a house which is enjoying the benefits of solar electricity and they're not connected to the grid at all and they've been using solar for the last 18 months in fact. Harish Handy is the local project manager. This is a typical solar light. 
that uh, are, is there in this house and there are three more lights that they are benefiting from. They were using uh, four kerosene lamps before in this house and this is, this is the quality of light they would be surviving for four to five hours every evening. Families have depended on these lamps for generations, but they're inefficient. Burning kerosene emits CO2 and the fumes cause severe health problems. Solar lighting has decreased the family's medical bills dramatically, but it's done more than just that. What has happened is many, in many of our families who are typically earning between one and a half to two dollars a day, it has doubled at three and a half to four dollars a day just by giving better conditions for lighting in the evening from three and a half to four hours. This is one of a number of international schemes funded and run by a British-based carbon offsetting charity. The atmosphere doesn't care where that CO2 comes from. This is a global problem. You don't have to invest in a project based in England to offset your emissions. The benefits that are felt by communities such as this are much, much greater. And the countries, developing countries, really need funds injecting into them to help them to develop in a sustainable way. And energy systems such as this are doing just that. So, should we really give up flying? Just checking in. Well, never before has the aviation industry faced so much pressure from environmentalists. And if the government does bow to the green lobby and flying is taxed to the hilt, then flying could become, as it was in the past, the preserve of the rich, rather than what it is now, an affordable free-for-all. Enjoy your flight. How are you? Stelios. Meet Stelios Hagianu, the man who kick-started the UK's revolution in low-cost travel and created an airline for the masses. Playing golf. <laughs> 35 million of us flew on EasyJet last year and his expansion plans mean he's become the favourite punch bag of certain members of the Green Lobby. But Stelios describes his fleet as the Toyota Prius of the skies, and he says he's operating the greenest airline in the business. A, a very good way to understand whether an airline spends a lot or a little on, on fuel is to actually look at their fuel bills. On average, we spend about £10 a passenger in, in fuel, when someone like British Airways, on average, spends £45. So you have to ask yourself, if, if there's going to be flying, might as well be on the, on the greenest possible airline. But not everyone agrees that hopping on a short-haul flight is the greenest way to go. Well, I mean, air travel is a luxury for some, and it's a necessity for others. There's been an, an enormous amount of short-haul expansion of flights. I would say it veers more to being, you know, long-haul air travel, more to being a necessity than a luxury. Well, I guess he would say that, wouldn't he? But the reality is that all of the airline industry has a part to play in the debate about aviation and climate change. You see, airlines are always looking to expand and open up new routes, and it's this kind of potential for growth that the Green Lobby is most concerned about. George Monbiot is one of the UK's foremost environmentalists and holds the most radical views on the UK's flying habits. The big problem we've seen is a complete abdication of responsibility when it comes to air travel by the government. And what it needs to do, I believe, is to start reducing airport capacity, reducing the number of landing slots, cutting down the size and the number of runways, eventually perhaps closing whole airports. As well as halting airport expansion in the UK, George Monbiot urges the government to ground 90% of all flights immediately. But if you look at the wider scheme of things, the contribution aviation makes is just 2%. It's not that much, is it? That's when you look only at carbon emissions. When you add in the other greenhouse gases, you have to multiply that by almost three times. So it seems to me that there is only one option left which is to limit the amount of air airport space and to throw into reverse this extraordinary and devastating growth in airport capacity that we've seen over the past 10 years.
George Monbiot has found an unlikely ally in the Church of England, where the sermons are now being preached about protecting the planet. The Bishop of London was even quoted in the press as saying that flying is a sin. Now, whether we wait for Branson to come up with a guilt-free aviation fuel, or, as George Monbiot suggests, we ground 90% of all flights, one thing is clear. As individuals, we need to do a serious rethink on our flying habits. So should we give up flying? Yes, we should give up flying. Well, of course we shouldn't. I mean, people can't. The reality is that these days, the world depends on aviation. There aren't many alternatives. Yes, I think wherever possible, we should try and cut down the amount of flights that we're all taking. Look for other alternatives that aren't so carbon heavy. As long as all of us who are getting on those planes are actually, you know, I think doing so for a, a reasonable reason. <sighs> Do holidays account as a reasonable reason? I don't know. You can't begin to be judgmental about which trips are essential and which are not. The issue is growth. So it's not necessarily that we need to give up flying altogether, but we need to not fly any more next year than we're flying at the moment. But sometimes even die-hard environmentalists simply have to fly. Jeff, when was the last time you went on an aeroplane? Uh, three weeks ago to Budapest. I certainly haven't flown for at least 18 months. It's not hypocritical to fly, it's hypocritical to keep on flying, it's hypocritical not to realise what you're doing, and it's hypocritical not to have an element of control and reduction. But we've never had it so good. Do we really want to stop? So it's up to you and me to make the stark choices as passengers. Either we choose not to fly or we offset our carbon emissions. And at this point, I'm afraid, I have to get down on my knees and confess. To make this programme, we've flown to India, Africa, the United States and several European cities. With all of this flying, our shameful emissions total is 32 tonnes of CO2. So to mop up at least some of that, it's time to offset. I'm going to plant some trees. So as flying opens up the world to us, are we in danger of destroying the very things we hold dear and want to preserve for future generations? There's no denying that we all face difficult choices, but as long as our travel remains affordable and accessible, with no restrictions on how often we do it, then the only voice we're likely to listen to is our own. If you would like to talk about this documentary online with other viewers, cca slash docs. Next time on The Passionate Eye. Sunday night. How many ways are there to kill off a political enemy? For 50 years, governments and gunmen have been vying to get Castro, but time is nearly up. Cuban intelligence has calculated 638 attempts on Castro's life. More people have tried to murder the world's most famous socialist than any other man alive. Some of these people live in the United States. We only have to be successful once. Some of them work for the American government. 638 Ways to Kill Castro explores the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. Cuba libre. As told through the countless attempts to kill Fidel Castro. A detective thriller. 638 Ways to Kill Castro. Sunday night, 